Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the show. It's Worlds 2020. It's the play-in stage. And for the teams of this group, it is the last day of that group stage play. At the end of this one, somebody's going home. Mm. Coming up next in front of us, we got Rainbow Seven taking on the unicorns of love. Uh, Rainbow Seven, they need to take some dubs. Oh, uh, yes. I think the team has been growing. They've been getting better. I've been seeing, like, more consistent team fights. But we already talked about this in their introduction, right? Like, this for me is the exam. Like, through the entire domestic season, they that's when they should be getting better, getting readied up for Worlds when they actually qualified. I would have really have wanted to see the vision play for them got, getting more consistent. But it hasn't been. And so, going up against Unicorns of Love, you heard it from in the interview, we need to see something surprising, something shocking, because Unicorns of Love are the favorites here, and I think that uh, it's for good reasons. Regular season is when you study, try not to skip your homework, try not to play hooky too much. Once you qualify and you go to the boot camp, that's a cram session in the library with yep. 17 different energy drinks for 23 hours in a row. And now's time to take the exam, my friends. Pass or fail. If you fail, you got to repeat the class next year. Nobody wants to do that. So we'll see if Rainbow 7 can come out on top. Going up against Unicorns of Love, who looked pretty damn good in their first couple of games here. Like I said during our previous game, their, uh, their matchup against V3 was very convincing, but it got a little wacky towards the end. And their win versus PSG Talon was a very close game all the way through. But remember how PSG Talon really took everybody by surprise with how good they were? Yes. So Unicorns of Love being able to take them down is a really good sign. This team is looking strong. Let's see how they contend with Rainbow Seven here as Oriana, Shen, and Nidalee will all be banned away. Yeah, it starts with the draft because Unicorns of Love's wins are really based around their team fights and consistently, conceptually, I feel like they've had the better compositions. Uh, the Swain bot lane, there's a reason why Orianna is banned. It's because it's flexible to Gadget and Nomads. Uh, so the fact that Gadget is pulling bans here, Orianna is one pick that he had, the Swain was the other. And in solo queue, by the way, he's been he's been spamming Karthus, just putting that out there. And he's already known for Heimerdinger, so you, can, you can't Ooh. really ban him out. Well, we'll see how they decide to go about doing it here. The Ash that we got to see in the previous game, and we've seen in so much competitive League of Legends recently, is banned away this game. So no Ash this time around. Feels like she's often picked when she's available. But hey, bans can solve a whole lot of problems. And speaking of problems, Get that Mr. Champion out of Razzleplasm. Here. What kind of a champion can assassinate a lame bully one on one at like level seven, then scale into a team fighting monster that can't die 1v3 and also gives all of his teammates a thousand free gold? The kind of champion I don't want in my game. Orn is out of there, not allowed in this game, and neither is Renekton. He's a real goat. That's the problem. <laughs> Greatest of all time. <laughs> Get this champion out of here. It's, it's disgusting in team fights, and you definitely don't want the team fighting team you, Unicorns of Love having it, so. Uh, oh, that's an instant pick on the Camille. Ooh, confident in the ability in the top lane there with the Camille. And Camille, I always like when we see her draft into the top lane because usually it ends up being a, a pretty fun matchup up there. A lot of times you get more exciting contests in the top lane when Camille is present as opposed to just meatball versus meatball who can get tankier type of a contest. So Camille versus Wukong could be very exciting, my friend. Usually this is a pretty great indicator on how Rainbow Seven wants to play the game because you would usually want the Camille versus uh, Orin pick if you're trying to play sides. But if you're trying to team fight, you definitely want the champ adding there. And honestly, Camille can play both sides. I think this is probably a good t a good um, hint that Rainbow Seven wants to go for a Camille Galio comp. If you go Camille Galio, yeah, Orin is a real uh, problem. And so I think it's a it's a it's a good look here if they can nail it down for them. It's really simple, straightforward. Um, and you're going up against a team that at times can be a little bit... Even in chaotic team fights, I feel like they all understand their roles individually incredibly well. Yeah. So they need to find something that they can rally behind. Well, Senna's locked in for the side of Unicorns of Love. So you got two pretty big, powerful team fighting ultimates there with Wukong and Senna working together. And oh, baby, Evelyn for the side of Rainbow Seven. This is such a heaven or hell champion. She's either the invisible champ who's actually invisible in the game and has no presence whatsoever, or she's all over the map, always somehow on the proper flank and just destroys everybody in half of a second. 
and you don't even understand how she's allowed to exist in the game. I love that sort of juxtaposition of which Evelyn you're going to get, and Jose Diotto's got the confidence he can be the kind to rule this game. Lucian also locked in here for Rainbow Seven. You were talking last game, Raz, about how you still really like this pick. Yeah. Uh, whenever you see an AP jungle picked pretty early on, especially Evelyn, I think Evelyn and Lucian are a really damn good mid-game combo because you'd want to put Lucian on side lane and then just have the, 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 the Evelyn just hover the champion because who's going to actually match him? Even if you're in a 50-50 matchup, well, Evelyn's going to solve that right quick, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> it's it's pretty like damn good from Rainbow Seven to say, hey, we already drafted the Camille. Now we're showing both sides of the top lane, uh, uh, the top side of the map, that we're just going to outright play side lane. I didn't initially like buy into that fact. I thought that they could just go straight into a team fight composition with this one and go for a Camille Gallio. But the fact that they're now going towards what is a really lane dominant Lucian pick, and then now wanting to play uh, heavily towards Alone and Asset, I think have executed a really strong thing to do. That means what we're looking at for the bottom lane of Rainbow Seven is a couple champions that can hang back, play safe, not get themselves killed while the team is split pushing and trying to facilitate moves elsewhere. And we'll see how the draft shapes up for that. Rainbow Seven has decided to ban away the Graves themselves, looking towards those jungle bans. And I like the Ziggs ban here from Unicorns of Love. I'm talking about how the bottom lane needs to have wave clear, about how the bottom lane needs to be able to play it safe. Well, Ziggs fits that bill. Yeah, and also the, you know, even though the damage spread is okay from Rainbow Seven side, they can do whatever they want. They can have a legitimate AD carry. Uh, they could have the Caitlyn is a good example of it, or they can just go straight AP. Uh, wave clear right now is, I think, what Rainbow Seven needs. Yes. Uh, if they're going to play a one-three-one, their three mid lane needs to be able to hold a team fight or just a straight push from Unicorns of Love side. Lily is the last ban of the draft. That champion. Honestly, still expecting to see her banned or picked every single game, so blue side taking care of it this time around. What will the pick be here? Nautilus locked in. So Nautilus and Sen, a lot of CC potential there. Either one of them manages to hit something, the other can follow up very, very easily, and also gives the team some additional engage potential besides just having Wukong. In the end, even though I still want to see where Unicorns of Love are putting some of these pieces, um, I'm expecting it to be a Senna Nautilus bot lane with a Casio mid, uh, Wukong top lane, and uh, by all means, just it would feel as though Unicorns of Love are just holding their jungle pick to see the full composition. Maybe it could mean like a, no a Nocturne, just to see if, um, by all means, like if the composition doesn't have too much CC elements, then you can run a Nocturne in team fights and match Evelyn on those side lanes. Um, so that's something that would come to mind for me. But in the end of the day, Unicorns of Love has a great front-to-back team fight with the Casio Mi Miasma, allowing Senna to do damage. So we'll have to see how it plays out. Alistar could throw a wrench into that. Yeah. Alistar, a strong champion for both engage and disengage. Ezreal picked up there for Leza. This champion is, if we're talking about staying alive, not getting caught out while two of your solo laners are split pushing the entire time, Ezreal's got a built-in flash on one of his basic abilities. Very easy to avoid some of the things that would kill a different champion. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Dang! Yeah, baby, there we go. Now that's something that you can use to pick off enemies when you have a numbers advantage, my friend. If you want to catch an Ezreal, you can do a Skarner. And if you want to catch that Evelyn in team fights, make her oh. life living hell, snatch him. It's em. so strong. It's Blow so strong. Up. I will tell you this right now. Evelyn also has no ability to contest Skarner in neutral territory without teammates nearby, as long as Skarner has the Spire. You can just run up to her, beat her up over and over again. As an assassin, her stat profile is incredibly low. Yes. And as a juggernaut, Skarner's is the opposite of that. Skarner is in a spot where he'll be able to take over those neutral areas. Remember the champion was changed recently, so his E no longer slows down when passing through units, gives him extra playmaking potential, especially early on in the game. Before Skarner has the ulti, the only CC is on the E, and now that you can fire that Fracture through the minion wave and make it hit the enemy champion so much more reliably, you do have better early pressure on the champion. I'm just so happy we get Skarner ready. We're getting it. We're getting it, I'm Cap. I'm so happy we get the Skarner This is for here. you, Cap. I'm so happy we get the Skarner here. This should be a very fun game. Hope we get to see some playmaking out of him. But looking at both the teams and how the compositions stack up. Don't spill that coffee. Don't, I'm, I know. I'm, I'm being very careful. I'm animated. You know me. But I'm making sure that both of my drink, I got my energy drink, I got my water, they're both on the side of the desk, 
outside of Yeet range. Nothing bad is going to happen to him. <laughs> We're good. And looking at these two compositions, looking at these two teams, for Rainbow Seven, they really want to find a win here. This team is one and two. This is the last game they're playing in the group stage. They, if a win, if they get a win here, they bring themselves up to even. They put themselves in a good spot to not be the team that just gets kicked out, right? You try to avoid some of that, low, some of those lower tiebreakers. But man, if this team loses here and goes to one three, that is a scary proposition. Yeah, tiebreaker situations are real here. Um, especially you talked about Rainbow Seven. It's insane. This is what you've built your entire year for. Um, you, we always talk about getting the Worlds. There was the initial worry about, you know, is Worlds even going to happen because of the pandemic? All of these concerns came through, but people had faith. That's what they were playing scrim after scrim, day after day for. And then you get to this position, you have to make it work. This is what it's all for. Always. And so for Rainbow Seven, they've, you know, put in some... Lessons studied a little bit from the previous games, going up against Unicorns of Love, uh, they recognize what comp they're dealing with and they just have to make it work. And even though, looking at Unicorns of Love's side, I think in terms of a straight 5v5, I love that comp. Um, that's why I'm kind of interested in what Keystone, you know, this Skarner is going to take. Predator. Predator, there we go. Um, just because I don't know how Rainbow Seven are going to take an outright team fight 5v5. They need to actually get these side lanes rolling. And they've been a team that struggled on playing through side lanes throughout the tournament. Um, so this is where it has to come down to. Rainbow Seven, you got to make it work. Rainbow Seven trying to run this split push composition and do so correctly. Look at the teleports on this team, three of them, both solo lanes as well as the AD carry using the teleport this game. If you look across the board, the same story is not told. It is only boss with that global presence. So as this game goes forward, as we get later into the match, there's definite macro outplay potential for Rainbow Seven to properly utilize those TPs and play the map. But if we're talking about this historically, Raz, when we look at how teams play, particularly from emerging regions, when they get to international competition like this, some teams, not all teams are created equal when mm -hmm. it comes to being able to play non-team fight styles. That's why Unicorns of Love, they were built in that. In the CIS region, it's just constant team fights. And ultimately, Unicorns of Love has been the team that stood a, a head and shoulders above the rest in that regard. And we got to see them when they went up against PSG, how damn good they were at that. And the compositions always, ma always made sense. Uh, you know, I always talk about the swing comp, but it was really well constructed. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I have a lot of faith in that regard. I do think Rainbow Seven has a, uh, yep, nice oh. ward being placed there. Get uh, that man! He, he tried, he tried. He went for the dredge line and he missed. So Rainbow Seven won't be too much worse for wear there. Both supports just take about 100 damage. Oh, but he's right back in! The Aftershock setting him up, but a nice disengage from Shadow means that it's Rainbow Seven who actually wins out in the bottom lane trade. There we go. Love that Shadow went for uh, the headbutt first. Um, just so there's no opportunity to trade back towards Rainbow and on Teleza. So we're in the pretty good uh, lane, st lane state right now for Rainbow Seven's bottom lane. Looking at both junglers, they're starting on opposite ends of the map, but they are both going for a full clear. Now, Alone is going in there to try to mess with Ananasik here just a little bit, but Skarner can easily pull the chicken into the brush there. You can't see, there's some sort of spectator visual error on the spire where it's not showing up, but Skarner is able to walk into that brush and take the chickens while still being under the effect of his spire. Yeah. So. For those who aren't aware, Skarner's Spire gives him unlimited mana regeneration. It gives him an incredible amount of flat move speed and also a ton of attack speed. 43% attack speed at level 1 up to 120 at level 18. So the champion gets an incredible amount of steroids as long as he's present on that buff. Very important to secure those if you're trying to do any sort of counter invades or just pick picks in general. That's the thing. The that's another element I didn't get to talk about that I really love the Skarner pick into Avalon is because you can actually just straight up clear for free. You're not going to be concerned about an invade. Even when Alone had a ward on top of Skarner, who are you actually going with, right? Yeah. There is no way you're going to be contesting Raptors on Skarner. So Skarner is going to be able to get a free level 6. Um, and then compositionally, we already kind of harped on it, but Jose Diodo is going to have real struggles in team fights, so we should never get to that part. Um, the, I will say, though, just as an asterisk, because I know there's a lot of positives with this Garner, the, the negative is that there's a lot of ways to kite him out. Uh, oh, yeah. There are too many ways. <laughs> Garner versus Ezreal and Lucian mm -hmm. is, um, 
you end up being a lobster kebab half the time. They just kite you away, shoot you full of holes. It feels really bad, but the Evelyn in melee range will be an opportunity there, particularly for Ananasik in these team fights. It could be a viable option to wait for the divers to come to you. Yeah. Skarner is very, very effective in assassin and dive based metas because champions that will be building for damage and getting close to you work out well as wow. mid lane alone really putting the hurt on to no man's here no summoner spells coming out just yet the bottom side the 2v2 breaks out laser gonna take some damage as santas tries to get himself away stunned up now shadow doing a good job making sure they get a return trade i like how aggressive both of these bot lane duos are being yeah it's really fun to usually like to watch a phase rush alistar play the game because it's just an instant proc on phase rush when you go headbutt pulverizer into e um the trample you it just procs immediately and it's pretty much a guaranteed uh, lockdown if you can make it happen. So it, it's fun to see that, um, you know, the, the trade mid lane, I actually would have wanted to see a lone stay in the lane a little longer because I think the Cassiopeia was pretty locked. That was two waves actually going to be crashing into the Cassiopeia with a cannon minion, and she took an awful trade. Um, yeah. So I, I actually expected alone to stay in there to punish a little bit more. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, he took, a, he took a base, TP'd back, and she's still locked down. She needs jungle help here. Ooh, Ananasik shows up. He does manage to land the Fracture onto the Lucian, but now Evelyn has joined the fight as well. Alone down to 200 HP, but thanks to Jose Diodo's presence, he won't be in any danger of actually dying. Ananasik using his Flash. So Skarner not having that once he hits level 6 means you don't really have the freebie kill that can exist if that summoner spell is prepared. Both junglers are level 5 right now, both of them incredibly powerful once they get that ultimate up and running. Huge game changer for both Evelyn and Skarner. Ananasik without a flash though. Yeah, here we go. He'll be walking back into his own jungle. Jose Diodo finding a little bit of damage there with the charm. The follow-up won't complete as Ananasik tries to head back into his jungle, but Jose Diodo maintains control on the way towards the Spire and just tries to keep him away. Cap, this is the funniest thing about this. The whole purpose of Ananasik coming mid was to relieve Cassiopeia of her duties, to send her back uh, to base. And so hovering over what Elise and, uh, Ev Evelyn ended up doing was really well done to make it so she literally cannot go back to base without losing uh, two sets of waves. So... This is getting a really annoying if you're looking at Unicorns of Love's perspective. Unicorns of Love. Wow, Shadow took uh, quite a lot of damage there. But it looks like they may try to set up a kill onto this Nautilus. It's a 3v1 Let's dive. Go. It's going to be a 4v1 dive. The teleport comes in. Santos could be in some trouble, but he's doing a good job with the CC here so far. Santos showing up, looking to keep him alive, able to provide the lockdown. Asse's there in the front. Santos going to be taken down. First blood over to the side of Rainbow Seven with the four-man play in the bottom lane. You can just tell they were communicating that as the dive was coming through. Ase recognizing that he's not going to be punished too heavily. He, it's not as though he had a huge wave on towards the enemy top lane turret, so it wasn't a free play. He was going to lose something for it, but he was already in a pretty huge advantage. Take a look at the top lane CS while it was happening. 57 to 36, Ooh. so he already had a huge advantage. He's willing to let, it, uh, let the rest of the map kind of uh, pay it forward. And before that play, before that setup, the rest of Rainbow Seven facilitating Jose Diodo's position in the enemy jungle to farm up the Wolf and the Gromp camp, Jose Diodo's level six. Ananasik is still only level five because of the fact that his stuff got stolen yeah. and the enemy jungler got some EXP from a kill in the bottom lane too. So Evelyn having that advantage right now means a lot. Level six is so huge for this champion, moving around the map undetected, being able to find the flanks that really define her play style will help him a ton. Yeah. Ananasik still not quite at level six, even after grabbing a camp there in the bottom lane, should have it here after the red buff. And Cap, all of this, if you do it, like, you know, team going to be doing a VOD review of this, of course, after the game. It all stems from the mid lane matchup mm -hmm. and how Rainbow Seven was unrelenting in making it so Cassiopeia wasn't going to get a free base off. And they got so much for it. You know, going into the bot side camps, both the Wolves and Gromp happened because Alone is just going to be far stronger than No Man's was, who didn't have mana to his name as well. So it just bled from mid to jungle, then to bot. I like how No Man's has gone for the Seeker's Arm Guard here at the beginning. Very effective itemization for any AP champion into an AD opponent, particularly one as strong in lane as Lucian is. But the nice part for Rainbow Seven is their jungler isn't affected by that in the same way. No Man's 
really going aggressive there, seeing if maybe he could get the Petrifying Gaze onto Alone, but Alone decides to hightail it out in time and does not fall victim to that one. Goes back in for a trade to farm up a little bit, but still loses about half his HP. Meanwhile, Rainbow Seven with Jose Diotto in the top lane are able to secure that Rift Herald for themselves with Camille's lane priority. You're talking about mid lane priority. Man, top lane has just been in control from start to finish. The 20 CS lead from earlier shrunk down to 15 because of the fact that Ase did roam bottom to help get that kill. But Boss is in a pretty bad spot. Okay. Yeah, he's in a pretty you. rough one. Um, especially since like, I actually expected him to do decently and match up and farm in the matchup. Um, hasn't been happening. And of course, so much action has been happening through mid and bot side that we didn't get the kind of full perspective there. So he needs a little bit of help. And it sucks because Ananasik came into this game expecting these lanes to be able to stand on their own so he could farm up to six right basically like free of charge and it hasn't been the case no sir and also because he's a predator jungler means he needs to make sure he gets those level one boots nice and early so it slightly delays his jungle item runic echoes is already done for jose diodo anonymous still doesn't have the full cinder hulk completed so it's still advantage evelyn in terms of power on the map Anonistic will give over this blue to No Man's here, allow the Cassio to have some extra spam power there in the mid lane, passes that one off just fine. Still no involvement from the Skarner to find a kill. Does have Flash ready here in a very short amount of time. Should be about 15 seconds. That one will be back up. And Flash plus ulti should be a guaranteed kill as long as no opponents have a QSS. Jose Diotto in the top lane only finds damage onto the Wukong clone, but just applying pressure to boss who's already having a bad laning phase can do wonders. Seeing the enemy jungler in the top side, Anonistic calls the boys over, and it's going to be a three-man Drake take here on the other end of the map. Ten and a half minutes into the game isn't a super fast early Drake by any means, but it's a neutral objective secured for the Unicorns of Love. And honestly, Raz, they needed to secure something. They yeah. had already lost First Blood, they had already lost the Rift Herald, and they're down one and a half thousand gold. At this point in the game, when the enemy team has Rift Herald and you don't know where she is, uh, just kind of playing through Fog of War, you don't want to commit to a full fight or a gank. Just because you lose far more in the opposite side of the map if she is there, right? So I love the fact that when they saw Evelyn topside, they just went for Dragon because they still had the time to kind of move top lane if they tried to press their advantage even further. But take a look at Ananas. It finds three members bot here. Here we go. Predator is ready to go. Oh. Jose Diodo is also here in the fight. He's going to blow up Gadget if he's not careful. Nice execution from the last caress as Santas goes too deep under the enemy turret. Now Jose Diodo's trying to get himself away. Ananas coming around. They can't find anything. Big mistake. Unicorns of love. You guys are about to be in a whole world of hurt. No man's going to be shot to pieces by Lucian. It's three for nothing in the bottom lane and Rainbow Seven are about to get even more. Rift Herald summoned up. They'll already have the turret down to just about two plates by the time she gets her charge off. This should actually be the complete first turret for the side of Rainbow Seven over Unicorns of Love, and they are destroying their opponent. That's a full level up from Rainbow Seven throughout the tournament. They look so much better now. Around Jose Diodo, their MVP jungler. Yeah. Insane. I have to correct myself, by the way. I said they thought they were going into three members. They didn't even see Jose Diodo. No. Uh, they thought they had two members clean, and they got humongously punished. Just take a look at this. They thought it was going to be a, a nice roundup on towards Leza, but Jose nope. Diodo rounds up and gets the assassination on Gadget. Really well done. That, or strictly from a Skarner perspective, that was such a bad flash from Anonisic. When you're up against a champion like Ezreal, you can't just go for a flash pull with Alistar right there. The kill potential is its actually zero. Yeah. You might as well have just never used the ultimate. The rest of the team can follow up so easily. Jose Diodo, such good positioning there to get the kill onto Gadget. If you're ever trying to make a play with a Skarner onto an Ezreal, you must prime him with your E first to make sure you can stun him as soon as the ulti ends. Otherwise, he's getting away. He's Ezreal. His flash is on his E. You must be prepared to commit more than just a single ulti. And that mistake, combined with underestimating and disrespecting the Evelyn, honestly puts Unicorns of Love in the worst position we've seen them so far in this tournament. And it's only going to get worse. Because while we did say how good this Skarner was going to be into the Evelyn, now you're going to be consistently invaded upon. The experience advantage is only going to get larger. And you don't have many options in fights, right? Oh, Gadget, <laughs> not a chance in the world. Jose Diotto on this Evelyn. Back to what I said in the draft. 
Evelyn's either invisible because she has no presence, or she's invisible because she's lurking on the flank, killing everybody in your team. And Jose Diodo is putting on a wonderful showing of this champion here in this game. Right, even Ase recognizing that their play was bot side doesn't want to be too greedy top lane. So the team is playing smart. This is actually the smartest we've seen Rainbow Seven play in the tournament, and this means a lot for the group implications. Because Rainbow Seven were in danger of being in a tiebreaker state with an LGD or a V3, but if they show this level of strength throughout the day, that changes instantly. LGD is currently one and two. Yep. V3 is one and two. UOL is two and zero. If they, if Rainbow Seven wins this game, we could see a massive amount of tiebreakers just across the board, my friend. It could be a real crazy show as Boss gets away from the Evelyn. Good use of the clone there. Even though he gets marked with the charm, remember it does take a small amount of time before it becomes fully armed and she gets the hard CC. So pretty easy for Wukong to get away from that one. As Rainbow Seven have three players in the mid lane, 14 minutes and 45 seconds in means plates are gone. Goodbye. Means turret is gone. Means more money in the pockets of Rainbow Seven and Unicorns of Love just struggling to find a real foothold in this game at all. Eight turret plates compared to two really tells the story of the difference in how well the early games have gone for wow. both of these teams so far. Honestly, just really impressed with Rainbow Seven in this early game. And they're just taking everything because Ocean Dragon's coming up in 30 seconds, but Rainbow Seven feels so comfortable that they can take both mid turret without the jungler's hover and he can go top side to cover for Ase. Take Rift Herald, they could even use Rift Herald mid and then take the dragon straight afterwards. Like, that's literally everything on the map and Unicorns of Love don't have anything to facilitate like a defense. Look at the total gold chart on the side of your screen right now. The fourth richest dude on Rainbow Seven has more money than the richest dude. Okay, now, well now I'm lying. They're trading back and forth a little bit. But either way, the money disparity absolutely massive. Between these two teams, five and a half thousand gold, 15 minutes into the game. That's that's a solo queue gold lead, Raz. It's pretty wild. <laughs> that's, that's, that's crazy, crazy stuff going on so far here. As we have the next Drake alive, remember first one did go over to Unicorns of Love, but Rainbow Seven seemed to not be taking any more of that. Look at the health just evaporate off of the thing, man. That Drake's going over, no contest. Anonastic walks up, but honestly, the man's got no business even being ah! there. Shadow did some goofy stuff over the wall, tried to go in, but Anonastic's running himself away. Shadow coming in from the side, Hextech ultimatum down. Look at him, maybe lock these guys down alone, grab the kill onto the Skarner. Now where the rest of the fight's gonna go. Boss trying to find the kill on alone, but now he's just going to be spinning around the Wukong Copter, not going to find the kill. Instead, he's in some trouble on his own. Here comes Cassiopeia. No man's flashing over the wall. Jose Diodo on a killing spree, trying to get himself away. He is going to be killed in return. No man's goes down. Look at that. An ace for Rainbow Seven. And they could only take one member. They thought they could outplay, but they just got squashed by Rainbow Seven. That's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, man. 7,000 gold lead. A team fight ace at 16 minutes. You lost Evelyn, but she died for the cause. Set her body aflame to the heartless sea and send her to Valhalla. She did her job. Let's take another look at the fight. I just love what I saw from Shadow and the rest of the team, honestly, because like when Alone goes in, confident that he can take down the Skarner, the rest of the team just followed. There's not a single member that, you know, didn't get that cue. And so, while it can be a little scrappy from this point, Jose Diodo recognizing that the Casio is coming into the flank and then immediately changing to, uh, team aggro on towards the Casio was really smart. Because if she gets, if she's a part of the fight and isn't targeted eff effectively, then there's an opportunity where Rainbow uh, Unicorns of Love can turn the fight. But uh, at this point, seems long gone. And, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. No, 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 no. If you're a Skarner player, uh, yeah. this is uh, <laughs> this is worse than Freddy Krueger, Tier and Nightmare, Camille, QSS, Lucian, QSS, Ezreal, QSS, Eve. She knows this game's a jungle diff. She's not even gonna buy one. She doesn't have enough respect for this Skarner to need one. She knows that that would stop her from buying her headwear, and that is just unacceptable. Three, one, and five for Jose Diodo. Playing this Eve so well this game. Going to take down yet another Scuttle Crab. The entirety of the map, owned by Rainbow Seven, constantly posing this threat. I mean, Unicorns of Love, what are you going to do? Any brush that you walk into could have somebody waiting. Anywhere you go that isn't control warded, Jose Diodo could just be lying there, ready for that flank. And he's just scouting ahead. 
Yep, I found him. He knows. Team, I've scouted an enemy. And and we don't even, we can't see the, the vision range, but I guarantee you he's hanging out right outside yep. the vision range of the plant there. Boss gets away. This is such a scary situation for Unicorns of Love. The Eve is just creating an impossible play state for them. As Rift Herald summoned up in the bottom lane, uh, it's just going to kill this turret instantly. The funny the thing the about team. an Evelyn, I mean, you basically have already said it, which is like, they didn't even fully clear out that blue side jungle, but it doesn't matter. Like, you are pushing them so far back into their own base, just based off that pressure. The, the only saving grace is the turrets, the tier two turrets here. So, um, they need to find a way uh, to at least push them back. What they were doing initially was a good idea, which is just literally stacking in a bush and hoping that someone walks in, but the Scryer's Bloom was pi uh, picked out and just uh, saw them completely. And it's good that Rainbow Seven, when they're moving, they're moving as a squad for these objectives. Here we go. Anonasic tries to move in and contest the red buff, but now he's going to just get shot down by the calling. The bullets over the wall just do it all. Alone picks up the kill. Alone takes the red buff. Did everything but give him the thumbs up emoji as Ase tries to just pass through the mid lane here. Look at that. Look at the beautiful blue mountains of Golgraphia on the bottom side of your screen. Rainbow Seven in charge from start to finish. You can see that big jump there right around the 11, 12 minute mark and it hasn't stopped maintaining that momentum since. Rainbow Seven going after the Baron here. Four players alive on the enemy team. No jungler around. Damage coming through. Senna ulti shows up. Nice engaged by Alistar on to three. The call is made. Secure the Baron. Now is the team fight going to happen? Yes, it is. Ase into the back line. Looking for no man's. Boss spinning around. Able to find a kill onto Ase. Boss wants to get himself away. Able to find the second knockup now onto Jose Diodo, who gets a kill onto Santos. Rainbow Seven. They lose their top laner, but they trade him away for a kill onto the enemy support. One for one, and you take the Baron at 20 minutes. Raz, I will take that trade any day of the week. Only thing you can get here. No, they can't even. I was about to say Dragon, but it's 20 seconds. That's easily contestable. So Unicorns of Love recognize that. They're going to get them on transition. Oh, this is so cheeky. Nobody would expect them to be waiting here in this brush right beside the base. All right, guys. Oh. We didn't need him anyways. We don't no. want the Alistar. <laughs> we don't want that guy. We want this what? guy that's worth more. Okay, he's looking for the Ezreal. There you go. Nice follow-up. They're able to put the ground on the ground. It's Miasma on the ground. It's not the ground on the ground. It's the ground and effect <laughs> on the ground. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore, but UOL has at least found themselves a kill. They're looking for maybe more, but now they're all trapped behind enemy lines. I don't think anybody's coming to save them. Shadow goes over the wall. They find the kill onto the Skarner. They find the kill onto everybody now as No Man's tries to get away, but Ase needs a little bit of revenge. Flashing out, Boss joins the other solo laner of the Unicorns of Love alone, kiting back, keeping himself alive. Shadow shows up, throws him underneath the turret. They went all the way back there. They stuck around, they set the trap, they killed the Ezreal, and the Unicorns of Love lose four men for it. Everything they're doing this game is falling apart. It's sad. And honestly, Unicorns of Love, they knew it wasn't going to be pretty if they were gonna win this one. So sitting in that bush, good idea. The problem is, it's season 10 no. and there's Cryer Blooms everywhere. Oh no. Nautilus, you just had a gameplay experience, brother. That's uh... That's a fed Eve. <laughs> there's, there's nothing else I can say about that. That was a gameplay experience. Let's take another look at what happened to Laser here. Now, this is very important. This is what you do with Skarner. You make sure you prime with the E. That way, as soon as they cleanse the ulti, you can immediately restun. The grounded effect, not the ground effect. I mean, everybody makes mistakes sometimes. Then locks him in place and he can't get away. But afterwards, uh, this kind of just looks like a party pack. Raz, they just get a whole bunch for not a whole lot. Jose Diodo. Going on a killing spree, taking down Anonasic here yet again. Zero, four, and one. The Skarner's so far behind the curve this game. Everybody having QSS, he just has no relevance. This game is getting a little wild. And, and, and for Unicorns of Love, as I said, it kind of has to be. Um, it looks bad, but I'm, at this point, they have to try a Hail Mary to get something back. And yeah. the fact that it's a Cloud Soul means that, or at least like, you know, potentially a, a Cloud Soul that they're playing for, they can't even use Drake as a win condition. Um, so try any way you can to get a pick, and it has to be on Skarner. So find that next bush. That's literally yep. what it's all about at this point. And I, I thought that was a really creative play because uh, they knew that Rainbow Seven was on a late base if they wanted to contest for next dragon. So things like that is what you have to do if you're UOL. It's just way too far behind. And at this point, we're, we were talking about how gassed up Jose Diodo is. She has the holy book, 23 stacks. Oh man, two pages left before he gets to the other cover. 
Jose Diodo is so strong on this Evelyn. If he finds anybody, he'll just blow him up. Nanasic clearing out some Krugs. Oh, no. I found another enemy. Oh, no, Mr. Scorpion. You are about to get got, my friend. He goes after the pole, but there's your last caress. See you on the other side, man. There is no way out of that. That is an Evelyn with a death cap. 25 stacks on the Magi's now. The Runic Echoes. Shadow might be in a bad spot. Petrifying Gaze coming out. There's the follow-up CC from Nautilus. They should be able to lock down this kill onto the enemy support, but Shadow, Fast. he's actually getting away. <laughs> Good Lord, man. The Alistar just said no. Nope. He walked out to the right. He's cosplaying Usain Bolt on that one. <laughs> he just walked away. He said, no, thank you, sir. Maybe next time, and left. And now, Asse's setting up shop in the bottom lane. The tier three turret is under pressure. There was two minion waves colliding with it. He sees the chance to find a little bit of damage and walk away. And the rest of the team, they're still hanging out up here next to the tier two in the top lane. Should be able to secure this one pretty easy. Alone is there. He has Leza and Shadow shadowing him. Easy turret. And this is all the things that we can see. I think a lot of people would be focusing too much on why aren't UL there to defend it. It's not simply about the pressure that Rainbow Seven are pelting topside. It's the Camille. Uh, Camille is, has a huge threat bot side of the map. The entire game, she's been dominating uh, boss in the matchup. Yeah. Um, so it, it isn't pretty. It isn't pretty at all. And Rainbow Seven can continue to split them. Should never have to fight them. Every time, every time the the Eve uh, Evelyn ultimate is up, she's just going to use it on anybody. There's no real front line that can take it. And you mentioned earlier how this game is such a level up for Rainbow Seven over the course of the play that we've seen from them so far at this tournament. And I really want to go back to that because they're one and two. Both of their losses were bad. Their one win was a comeback and now they are just absolutely thrashing the unicorns of love. Boss going back in onto Jose Diodo nearly gets himself killed, but now the last caress is gone. That's a shutdown. Jose Diodo making his big first, or his first big misplay of the game given that money over, and with him off the board, that's going to be Rainbow Seven at least having to ease off that pressure for 45 seconds or so. Yeah, we finally got it. <laughs> finally. It took a lot. It took a lot, and it also required Jose Diodo to lose a few cells, you know, brain cells, before they could finally pick up the Evelyn. <laughs> he, was, he was just feeling it, man. He was limit testing. Don't worry about it. Baron is up now. Baron's That's up. 16 seconds on Jose Diodo for his mistake. You got to go for it. You were talking earlier about how you have to go for these Hail Marys. Well, tell your receivers to all go deep. It's a Baron or bust for the Unicorns of Love. Rainbow Seven moving in, looking to stop him. Boss has no ulti. Keep it in mind. Oh. Shadow's able to find the three-man knockoff. Rainbow Seven going in, looking for the engage, looking for the kills, looking for the team fight. Able to find one on DeSantis. Anana Stick going in. Anana Stick going out. No way to close the distance on that one. The Unicorns of Love, baby. Unicorns might be real, but they're an endangered species. Double kill for the Lucian. And teleports are coming in to cut off the escape for No Man's. It's No Man's Land indeed. And No Man's Land is right back in the spawn platform now. Ace for Rainbow Seven. They have a huge top lane wave tier two. They can just end the game off this one. Rainbow Seven, you heard it in the interview. It felt like it was going to be impossible for the team with how they played this tournament out that they could take down Unicorns of Love, who were, who were undefeated. But man, they look strong right now. The best game of play-in so far by Rainbow Seven, Jose Diodo, summing up the entire game with one kill at the very end. Rainbow Seven take down Unicorns of Love, and damn, do they look good doing it. Two and two now. And we have a surprisingly long day ahead. It may just be two games. Oh, yeah. But then you talk about the, the, the tiebreakers that feel it's going to happen, right? Oh, yeah. The, the stage is set, man. What? I am so impressed with Rainbow Seven. I've got to sing their praises more. This is the team. I was worried for this team coming into today. Yeah. Like I said, their two losses did not look like good losses. They did not look like redeemable losses. The win was one they had to work really hard for and also depended upon some pretty big mistakes from their opponent. And then to come into today, the last day of group play for this group, and just smack unicorns in the love, unicorns of love in the mouth like that. Absolutely incredible from Rainbow Seven. I think this looks so good for this team. 
as this day is about to close out. And let's go ahead, let's check out Rainbow 7's Mercedes Drive to Victory, the bot lane turnaround that started this snowball. I wouldn't mind being a passenger in this one. Yeah, Jose Diodo, it had to be. Uh, just being able to be here, hover for the play, he was holding on to that Rift Herald for so long, he knew he eventually wanted to be bot side. He read the play from Unicorns of Love to be coming there, and he just saw the AD carry and took the kill. So good. Uh, intellect it was, is what it was for Jose Diodo. I thought that that was a really smart play in a really smart game. So when, when we were talking about this team, what we heard from uh, you know Rainbow Seven was that mental resilience was the key point for this team. Yeah. Skin, their coach, constantly kind of, it felt like guiding this team. The players themselves have been in these positions before. Like in the finals, it felt like they should have been 3-0'd. Like it was that close up against all night their regional rivals. But then they hunkered down, played better. You gotta do. Felt like they were smarter. They were developing during a best of five and then got there. And it feels like they're developing throughout this uh, the stage of the, this tournament. So it really doesn't, you don't know how the rest of the group is going to turn out. And as Rainbow Seven take over the Rift, you can be sure to check out the World's Anthem Take Over on the League of Legends official playlist on Spotify. You can stream the song, watch the full behind the scenes video on the making of the Takeover music video as well. And remember, you can't get this anywhere, man. This can't just occur anywhere on Summoner's Rift. This is available only on Spotify. Now we're gonna take a break, but once we return, we've got game three of the day, where PSG from the PCS challenges the LJL's V3 Esports. Don't y'all go anywhere. That PSG result, that's 2-0. We had a perfect display of both individual brilliance and some team play. In this group, I am really now looking forward to seeing V3 face off against PSG. Hello everyone, I'm Efia Shogs the Portre. Alongside some other faces you may recognize, I'm very excited to host MasterCard's Clicks of the Decade, where we will count down the top plays from 10 years of International League of Legends. Dr. Shockwave! The Quadra kill for Hootie! And that is the miracle play that keeps CLG alive! Make sure you follow at MasterCard Nexus on Twitter so you don't miss the first episode.
welcome back to the State Farm Analyst Desk. And it did take a rainbow for the benevolent unicorns to bleed their silver blood. The undefeated streak has turned Group B on its head with R7 ending all of that. I've got Yamato and Amazing just to get those reactions, boys. It was not necessarily what we expected, uh, but Rainbow 7 did show the unicorns of love can falter. Yeah, and especially in the fashion of their falter too, because there was so much early aggression from R7 like that unicorns is actually able to deal with usually, but this game, they fell apart. Yeah, for sure. I think just um, the quality of the draft, I really like the top side and then the Ezreal, Alistar, everything kind of pieced together. And the moment you're ahead with Evelyn, as they pushed for, the game just looked kind of over. But we saw you well. I mean, you were talking about them just toning down that overconfidence, for lack of a better summary. Uh, but we're seeing Skarna's pulled out. They pulled out a Cassiopeia. I mean, was this this is a different look, or is this more UOL goodness? I think on paper it kind of makes sense. The yeah. Cassian to Lucian is a yeah. very old counter, but uh, with the adaptation to the match of Lucian can dash forward, Lucian can win, and also on top of that, the Skarna is just a lower quality champion. It all comes down to how the early game pans out. Evelyn's ahead. Game is over. Yeah, and of course, our, we have to crown an Oppo player of the game. And in this one, it is none other than Jose Diodo. If he has one fan, it is I. We can see, of <laughs> course, all of the uh, highlights of what he was up to this game. Big impact from this guy. Yeah, definitely. Especially in the early game when he uh, destroyed the enemy center in uh, in the bottom lane, hid in the bush, and suddenly made that play happen. He was really confident, and that's what I like to see from someone that um, has to make plays for his team to work. He was, was also so, so active on the map the moment he got that advantage because Evelyn, the moment she gets her that blue jungle item, she just farms up to that death cap very quickly. And uh, the tricky thing about Evelyn when she's ahead is she just covers the entire map. You need to respect her and it's hard to make any place to come back because she becomes like a six member almost. Yeah, omnipresent. Just, yeah, she's yeah. just Ooh, omnipresent. Omnipresent, I absolutely love it. But for more on this game, why don't we go ahead and head over to Law, who's managed to grab UOL's mid laner. And welcome back to day three of planes here. The rainbows are stronger than the unicorn, but I mean, no man, you're still in a good spot here to reach group stage. So can you explain what went wrong here? And was it only due to Evelyn uh, pumping off? Uh, yeah, kind of Evelyn. I mean, we should, I, I still don't understand. It feels a bit frustrating. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, why we lose uh, yet, but um, yeah, I think we should pick uh, different champions on. Uh, some of our positions, so yeah, it would be an easier game. All right, yeah, I mean, you can still make adjustments and you've been um, very creative with the drafts that you've been using on stage so far. So I know you can't reveal too much, but do you have still some tricks up your sleeves for the nice yeah. game? Uh, next game is LGD, right? Yeah, correct. Uh, well, I don't know. I think we, against LGD, we'll just draft uh, like good team fight comp. Mm -hmm. uh, Strong early, good team fights, and uh, yeah, we'll see who will win. Yeah, it's a good thing that you mentioned uh, team fight comes here because we've we, we've seen that uh, LGD has an issue when it comes to approaching team fights and also uh, objective control. So through these weaknesses, is there something that you can focus on to beat them in the game four? Um, before this game, we were watching R7 uh, LGD game, mm -hmm. and uh, seems like uh, Pinat trolling a bit. So yeah, maybe that's. Uh, their weakness that we can abuse. And besides that, I don't know, like just in fight. Okay. <laughs> win team fights, win game. Just in fight, win games. Thank you very much, No Man's, for the interview. And I wish you the best of luck against LGD <laughs> later. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. And we're going to take a break and we'll come back in a few minutes for PSG Talon versus V3 Esports. Stay tuned. Yeah, thank you very much, Law. I love that. I mean, just win the team fight, win <laughs> yeah. lane, win games, practically calling Peanut a, a, a trolling lagoon. Madness. <laughs> but either way, let's move into our next game, PSG Talent taking on V3. And a reminder that the representatives from the PCS have been impressing under an unenviable circumstances. So here I go. I'm just going to fill my lungs with air. <clears throat> So let me explain them. Now, due to travel restrictions, a visa requirements, River, Tank, and Unified were not able to kick off PSG's world run. In order to accommodate this, Riot offered a limited alone program, which gave PSG the mid-jungle duo from AHQ, Uniboy and Kong Yue. Plus D, as a free agent, he brought him in, taking a, a, a year hiatus from the game and then stepping back onto the Rift for Worlds. And despite all of that, PSG are still 2-1, and one, which is testament to the strength of the PCS on this Worlds stage. But he's back, yeah. boys, Unified. First game of Worlds, only took a couple of extra days. Yeah, we talked about it earlier, like it should bring in more uh, synergy in the bot lane. They should be able to play more champions, increase their champion pool and honestly increase their options. 
Is there any particular options that are at the tip of your tongue with the return of Unified? I'm just stuck at how aptly named he is because they are unified again. Certainly. But uh, I, think just, missing. I think just uh, the carry champions, maybe a Twitch, yeah. maybe anything that requires yeah. a higher mechanical skill, some of the things that require more synergy in the bot lane, maybe Braum combinations. There's a Thresh uh, mix as well. Maybe Thresh mix. There was a Kalista Thresh. I don't yeah. know how relevant it is in the current meta, but mm. it just showcases the fact that these two players can work together super, super well. And I think that was one of the weaknesses that were showcased against UOL when they had to pick Jin in that situation when it's not the best pick. Now, I'm afraid it's a nice open-ended question for you here, which is, you know, is the damage done? Is the return of Unified a little too little too late? What do you no, think? No, I, I don't think it's too little too late. I think they already look good. They already look pretty unified in the team fights, especially. I think now that extra bot lane strength should actually be able to make them get to that late game stage very early. So now looking at the roster, it does still read pretty damn good, Yamato. I mean, you've already had a success with three stand-ins. I assume success continues with two. I think they should be super, super happy that uh, Unicorns of Laws just lost their match right. against Rainbow Seven because yeah. that uh, puts them in a position where they could potentially get a rematch. And that's going to be so, so big because the last time around, the draft was in such a poor condition because they drafted three melee champions into a first big Renekton. That's something that you can remedy and then we might have a real game at our hands yep. where we really test the strength of these two teams. Fingers Thanks, crossed. Because. I'm down for that. Yeah, a little left, right, good night action to round out our day. But we're not there yet. We'll be right back with Quickshot and Cadrill taking to the caster desk of a PSG Talon versus V3. We'll see you in a sec.